Good afternoon and welcome to the Huxley Speaker Series. My name is Stefan Freeland. I am the coordinator of the series and this will be our first talk for spring quarter 2021. Uh, quick reminders, we'll do questions at the end of the talk and uh, you can submit questions via text or uh, uh, the chat or the Q&A at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Probably if you go to speaker view in the Zoom settings, that'll serve you better, but uh, if not, feel free to play around and figure out what setting works best on your device and your screen and your size. Um, and uh, if you have technical questions, you're, you know, use the chat if you can or shoot me an email. The whole speaker series is up on the line, so look forward to seeing you for a bunch more talks every Thursday at 4.30. And today, kicking off our series, it is my pleasure to welcome Andy Bunn. Andy was one of uh, the faculty here at Huxley College at Western Washington University. He's a climate scientist who focuses on changes to Arctic carbon cycling and paleoclimatology, working extensively in the uh, Russian Far East uh, mountain systems around the world. The link between climate change and human energy use uh, led Andy to found the Western Institute for Energy Studies in 2012, uh, which has uh, 60 majors now, uh, focusing in energy science and energy policy. But Andy turns out not to have liked admin, admin as well. So he went back to just teaching and doing research much to our benefit. He got a BS in Evergreen, from Evergreen State College, a master's in environmental management from Duke University, a PhD from Montana State University, and did his postdoc work at uh, Woods Hole Research Center um, before coming to Western in 2006. So uh, a lot of his work takes place up in the mountains and trees and the, that, that uh, research into climate and what has happened in the past, as well as where we're going, I guess. Um, so with that, it is my great pleasure to welcome Andy Bunn. Take it away, Andy. Hello. Hey, Stefan. How's that look for everybody? Good. Cool. Um, well, thanks for the intro and thanks for the invite. It's really lovely to be here. Uh, it's been a couple of years since I've done a Huxley uh, speaker series talk a number of years actually so it's great to see it and it's great to see the um the way you've taken it over Stefan, and are running it it's really rewarding to see uh such great community support and so many people attending and it seems like it's working even remotely which is awesome i've enjoyed tuning in during the covid times um so it's really nice to be here thanks let me just see if this all right there we go um so i want to talk to you all today about the work I've been doing for about two decades now, trying to understand the ways we can use long-lived trees and reconstruct patterns of temperature and precipitation and other environmental variables using tree rings. Um, so most people probably know that you know trees in uh, the extra tropics. So in the North and Southern hemisphere where there's seasonality, trees will put on a ring every year. And by understanding the sort of chemical composition inside of tree rings and the width of the tree rings and the density of the cells, we can use them like a book and turn the pages backwards in time and try and understand what the environment was like when those trees were growing. And so I've been really fortunate to work with long-lived tree species all over the world. And I've been really lucky to be able to take students from Western um, to the far-flung corners of the earth to find really old trees and learn about the stories that they can tell us by reading their tree rings. Um, so I'll talk today about work I've been doing with bristlecone pine, the longest lived trees in the world, and some of the science we've done and try and understand some of the mysteries that are in there. Um, I have been at Western since 2006, which now seems like a really long time, um, but I'm hoping to continue to do this work for many decades to come. So bristlecone pine are notable for individual trees that attain great age um, for its use in the calibration of the radiocarbon timescale. A lot of times people think that we now, we understand how old these trees are by using radiocarbon to to get an age on the trees. And the opposite's actually true. The radiocarbon time scale is calibrated um, to things of known ages. And that calibration is derived in part from uh, bristlecone pine tree rings, because we can count the rings backward and know how old the trees are, and then calibrate how much sort of carbon 14 there is in them, and then 
that's how the radio calo, uh, radiocarbon scale is calibrated, not, not the other way around. The other thing bristlecone pine are known for are for providing a really strong element in temperature and precipitation reconstructions. So the ring width chronologies that we can make from bristlecone pine are annually resolved, meaning there's a ring every year, and they can reach back thousands of years. So this makes these really high resolution, um, what we call paleo climate proxy records. So it's a biological uh, mechanism that stands in for temperature or precipitation or some other environmental variable. They're a really rare and valuable resource and they're also an incredible species to be able to work with. This is um, a Western undergrad. This is uh, Chris Caruso who's a, a long graduated now Western undergrad who's been able to do field work with me. This is in the snake range of Nevada. This is a, a remnant sort of bristlecone pine that's standing up on the mountain. This uh, tree dates back to about 3000 years ago at a time when the tree line was higher than it is today. And the tree line sort of ebbs and flows up and down slopes over time and leaves behind these remnants, these giants that sort of stand there and and sort of testify to what the environment was like, you know, often thousands of years ago. And to see these is to be struck by their beauty, but also by how strange they are. Uh, no two trees are alike. Some are stooped and some are tall and some have multiple trunks and intricately spiraling uh, limbs. And they owe their morphology to the special way their roots and trunks are connected. Uh, most trees pool their resources. The little tree will slurp up water with its roots and then send the water up around the base of the trunk and sort of nourish each section of the bark equally. Uh, bristlecone and pine don't do that. They don't share water in that way. Instead, they connect directly with a particular section of bark. So if a root is damaged or otherwise unproductive, the attached strip of bark will die and each sector kind of fends for itself in kind of a, a long lived sort of intra organism longevity contest. And this grows, this leads to this incredibly bizarre morphologies of the trees and it helps them attain their tremendous age. Uh, the individual bristlecone pines can live for thousands of years. They really are just absolutely uh, remarkable. This is a picture taken at night. You can see the stars in the, in the background and the moon behind the tree. Uh, many of the pictures you're gonna see in this slideshow were taken by my long time collaborator and friend, uh, Chris Linder, who has himself given a Huxley uh, speaker series. Uh, he's a photographer that specializes in documenting uh, scientific field work and I owe a great debt of gratitude to him for accompanying us on a trip and, and photographing for us until I wanted to acknowledge him. You can find him at, at Chris Linder and almost all the social media. The bristlecone pine sort of came to awareness in, um, in the broader sense amongst the public with this uh, National Geographic uh, cover from 1958 describing what we uh, call the Methuselah tree. This is, uh, this is the National Geographic from March of 1958. And uh, shown on there is the Methuselah tree. This is the oldest known living bristlecone pine tree. And it's um, uh, about 4,800 years old, just a, a few years short of that. And there was an older tree that I'll, mention, I'll mention later that's a little bit older, the Prometheus tree, which was sadly um, cut down. But these are, um, the Methuselah tree itself is not remarkable. Its location is, is hidden, um, but um, I, know, I know where it is. And if you get, you'd, be, you'd be standing in the grove where the Methuselah tree is and not be able to differentiate it from the other trees around it. There can be incredibly sort of subtle in there, which, which trees are multi-millennial giants and which ones, you know, are... Uh, which ones are 5,000 years old and which ones are merely 1,000 years old. It is really remarkable. But this National Geographic article really uh, brought awareness to the public that there were these multi-millennial, you know, multi-thousands of year old trees on the landscape um, and sparked a sort of interest in, in very, very old trees. This sadly is the site of uh, what was the a longer lived tree um, known as uh, popular as the Prometheus tree 
um, which was the oldest non sort of clonal organism in the world. And it was near Wheeler Peak in what is now the Great Basin National Park in Nevada. Um, it was at least um, 4,862 years old and almost certainly more than 5,000 years old uh, when it was cut down in 1964 by a graduate student um, with, uh, uh, along with uh, US Forest Service personnel um, for research purposes. And it was really an incredible tragedy that the, the um, crew that cut it down had no idea how old it was when they cut it down. It wasn't until the rings were counted later that it was uh, determined that, it, that they had cut down what was the, the now we know it was the oldest, the oldest known tree that we know about um, on the planet. There are almost certainly trees that are older than that out there on the landscape. They're incredibly hard to, to get an um, absolute oldest date age on some of these oldest trees because they're very difficult to core because of these this really weird growth morphology that they have, the sort of multiple stems and twisting barks um, and spiraling limbs. It's hard to get an increment borer all the way to the center of the tree in order to determine how old it is. And it was this tragedy of cutting down this tree that let us know how old these trees could get. And the upshot was that it did help uh, lead to the creation of Great Basin National Park, um, ultimately in, in the end. Uh, but they become, you know, sort of remarkable cultural touchstones. Uh, this is the stump of the Prometheus tree uh, near Wheeler Peak in Nevada. And the awareness of how old these trees were and how magnificent they are, not only how beautiful they are, but what incredible sort of cultural touchstones they are, were sort of kicked off, you know, throughout the um, 60s and 70s. And now they've really become a, uh, you know, a, a touchstone of sorts. And the Prometheus tree in particular has been um, justifiably sort of uh, um, a focus or an obsession of sort of uh, people sort of across the, um, oh my gosh, is my phone going? I should have muted it, huh? Um, there we go, that'll do it. Across the, uh, across a lot of different sort of disciplines, I've been able to work with as part of my work with, uh, with personal compliance, like an incredible uh, visual artist, a guy named Jeff Weiss, um, who has done a lot of sort of uh, visual, and visual art related to Prometheus tree. I've got this snow globe here. I should have actually brought it down. Um, Jeff Weiss has created these snow globes with a reconstruction of what the Prometheus tree looked like. And there's been a variety of other artists um, and uh, musicians who have worked with uh, the bristlecone pine tree room record. And it's really become a phenomenon that goes way beyond sort of the kind of uh, paleoclimate science that I do. Including, it's become an inspiration point for uh, the Long Now Foundation. I don't know, and some of you I'm sure are familiar with this. Um, there's a, an organization, um, a nonprofit that's sort of committed to sort of long-term planning for humanity. And one of their goals is they're building a clock that will, mechanical clock that will run for 10,000 years without having to be touched by human hands. Uh, this is sort of a prototype of what it's going to look like. And it will sort of, you know, tick once a year and, you know, once a century, it will make a chime and then a gong will go off, you know, every thousand years. And the organization, which is comprised of sort of, uh, a huge variety of people, including some futurists um, um, and musicians like Brian Eno and uh, Ray Kurzweil have uh, uh, started this, this foundation. And one of the places they were looking at to situate this clock was in, the, in, in a location in Nevada, um, not actually too far from Wheeler Peak. And they are, they're trying to find a cave in order to build it in where it'll be safe sort of over geologic time. And a piece of land that they acquired uh, actually had multi-millennial bristlecone pine growing on it. And uh, they didn't sort of know the, I don't think they knew the extent of the paleoclimate history that was on this land. They ended up sadly not building the clock uh, underneath the roots of these uh, old bristlecone pine, which I think would have been absolutely marvelous. They, they chose another location that was geologically more suitable. But I've gotten to interact a little bit with these folks um, because we do research on property that they own or is, is adjacent to. Uh, and it's really remarkable. So the public interest in bristlecone is, is just phenomenal. And it's really a, a treat to be able to be part of it um, in various different ways. This uh, included uh, uh, 
about a couple of years ago now, uh, Alex Ross, who is a staff writer for The New Yorker, got in touch with us. Um, he asked me if he could come out in the field and work with us. And he's not a science writer. He's a classical music uh, writer for The New Yorker. Uh, he's written, he'd written one other, I think, natural history piece. Um, but, you know, his latest book was on Wagner. And he asked if he'd come out into the field with us. And I you know, was delighted. And so he came out and spent, uh, spent a couple of days with us in the field, sort of looking at old trees and seeing the kind of work we do. And then published this really remarkable um, uh, piece in The New Yorker about bristlecone pine and the science that we do. And uh, this did sort of, uh, um, this is a remarkable sort of piece of outreach and, and work and in our interest in our research sort of has, uh, has bloomed since then. This was in the um, uh, January issue in uh, 2020, I guess. One of the January issues in 2020. So I wanted to sort of give this background to you to, to, to sort of set the stage that like, you know, not only is the, you know, interest in bristlecone pine sort of scientific in nature, it's also quite cultural. Um, people's interest in these trees ranges sort of far beyond the, the you know, the really dry aspects of, of ring widths and understanding temperature and precipitation that, that I'm interested in. So I did want to give that as a little bit of background. Um, so Shifting gears a little bit, not only do we, you know, have this sort of modern sort of cultural interest in them, we can use these trees to not just understand the sort of dynamics of the atmosphere and temperature and precipitation, but we're also using these trees to understand sort of other impacts to uh, societies. So I'm going to describe a little bit how some of our research has, has um, dovetailed a little bit with uh, anthropology and archaeology and describing what's called the 4.2 KYA event. And that's a climate event that started 4.2 thousand years ago, about, about 2200 BC. And it was a climate event that lasted the entire um, 22nd century and caused or was implicated in the collapse of the old kingdom in Egypt, as well as the Akkadian empire and, and Mesopotamia. And it was the world's sort of first empire was were established during this time, 4,300 years ago. Um, between the Tigris and the Euphrates River. And for the Akkadian Empire, the, the details of its founding by Sargon of Akkad have come down to us somewhere in between sort of um, history and, and myth. And one of the sort of mysteries of the 4.2 KYA event is that uh, exactly when it occurred has, ne has never been able to be properly dated. And we've been able to use uh, bristlecone pine to help determine, uh, you know, a probable uh, individual year for that, that event. Um, this is a remarkable sort of uh, feature that we see in every one of our samples that dates back that far. This in the year 2036 BC, we found in all of our samples, and this is, these are samples in California and Nevada that show this uh, extreme climate event in, in 2036 BC, what we call a frost ring and it is a, uh, a it is an embolism in the tree ring that can occur when temperatures drop very very quickly during the growing season causing the water in the cells to burst and when that happens it leaves behind these sort of this sort of telltale um, pattern where we see these these cells that have burst in this individual year and this happens in every single tree line species that we have in the 2036 ring. And it's been really cool to work with a variety. When we sort of found this out in, in this individual date. And this is much further than most tree ring records can sort of explain. We're able to show when this embolism occurred. And it, uh, it sort of got a lot of people that were working in the, the societal aspect of the of the 4.2 KYA event uh, excited, and it sort of implies that there was a uh, almost certainly a large volcanic eruption during that year. And the question is, is how would that influence the climate dynamics that would cause uh, drought and collapsing civilizations um, all the way across the world? And this is a sort of zoom in of the individual tree cells during that year, and you can see in the sort of red picture, you can see these are. Uh, burst cells uh, during that year that occur across every sample that we have that spans that. Uh, these blue cells on here are stained to show um, uh, to show that event. It's it's those that show up during partial lignification when the temperatures uh, get cold enough that the tree wall 
uh, the cell walls can't properly form. And uh, this is, we know from a variety of research, this indicates sort of a large uh, summer volcanic eruption that would affect the entire globe for a, few, for a few years after the eruption. So it's really remarkable. And it led us uh, sort of delve into this, what's been called the curse of a cod, um, which is a uh, one of the few pieces that we have of, of sort of the impact um, that civilizations face as a result of this this climate event. And it was, uh, for the first time since cities were built and founded, the great agricultural tracts produced no grain, the inundated tracts produced no fish, the irrigated orchards produced neither syrup nor wine, the gathered clouds did not rain. Um, he slept on the roof, died on the reef, et cetera. And so this is this, this event that we know occurred in human civilization. We don't know exactly until the Bristol Cone Pine record came, we didn't know exactly when it occurred. And we've been able to be part of this project where we're uh, combining uh, tree rings, high resolution sort of what we call dendroclimatology with this uh, trying to understand the civilization impact and things like dating of ice cores um, to line up places in the ice core record where we know there are high concentrations of sulfur that indicate tree ring eruptions and how that can uh, feed directly back into uh, cooling effects and the effect and the disruption of weather patterns that might cause, say, extreme drought that would last for multiple decades over places like the Tigris and Euphrates. So this has been a, like an unexpected sort of detour in my research, and it's been really rewarding to work with these large sort of large international teams to uh, help date these ice cores, work with the uh, archaeological community, um, and try and put dates on these things. And it's been a really fun sort of detour. So. I'll switch to a, a slightly sort of more research that sort of, um, you know, relates directly more to what I study uh, in terms of trying to understand how we can look at the alpine tree line of bristlecone pine, these incredibly long lived tree species, and trying to understand how the tree line moves up and down the mountain slope over periods of sort of decades to centuries. Uh, this is the Snake Range in Nevada. And you can see sort of very clearly on there, the place where the uh, tree line, the trees are replaced by uh, rock mostly uh, above, the, um, above the upper elevational extent of where trees can grow. And this is understood sort of widely as a place where once we get above the tree line, it's too cold for uh, pine trees to be able to grow. In this case, it's replaced not by any other plants at all, but just by, by tundra plants, but mostly just by rock. And I'll tell you quite a bit about what's going on um, sort of in the Snake Range in Nevada and also in a place that many of you have probably been. This is the ancient, this is the ancient bristlecone pine forest in California. And so most people who have traveled to see bristlecone pine, um, this is where they'll have, uh, this, is really, this is where most likely where you're gone. Um, the ancient bristlecone pine forest is part of the Inyo uh, National Forest and it's in California, east of the Sierra Nevada where it's incredibly cold and dry. And when we're there, it's really like working on a, on a different planet. Now, this is my collaborator, Matt Salzer. Um, and this is above the tree line um, on Sheet Mountain in the, in the White Mountains of, uh, of the Inyo National Forest. And uh, it's in this kind of landscape where we find it a lot, walking along in this moonscape, places where the tree line 5,000 years ago um, and uh, three, three to 5,000 years ago was higher than it is uh, today. And so here's Matt coring a remnant bristlecone pine that's about 100 meters above where trees currently grow. And this, um, this dates back um, about 3,000 years. And by taking cores from these trees, by drilling into them with hollow core drill bits, um, we're able to extract cores of these trees and then read the individual rings uh, going back in time. And by measuring the width of the ring and the density of the cells and looking at the chemical composition of the trees, we can infer what the climate was like while the trees were growing. And we do this, we take, uh, you, know, um, you know, first, uh, you know, dozens of cores and we take them out of the tree and we mount them in these little wooden blocks. And then we sort of sand them to within an inch of their life. And so we can see the individual cells that are underneath and we can line them all up um, like barcodes so that we know the individual years sort of perfectly of exactly when it was growing. And then in the lab, we can 
uh, measure the individual tree rings, and we can build these really long chronologies of growth. So here's, uh, here's a student, and this is, this is our lab uh, in the ES building, and inside of the tree ring lab, um, working with an ancient bristlecone pine sample and building one of these tree ring chronologies. And you know, the way that it works is that we are able to take trees that are still living, you know, sort of have the bark on the outside and core those trees and measure those as far back as we can. And then we're able to take these remnant trees, these snags that are standing above the landscape and core those. And then we're able to line up the patterns of the outside dates of the, the recently dead trees and line them up with the inside dates of the still living trees and build these ladders back in time. And with bristlecone pine, because they're so long lived and because the environment's so cold and dry that the, um, there's not a lot of decay happening, we can build these incredibly long tree ring chronologies uh, that go back thousands of years. And this is one of the only places on the planet uh, that, you can, that you can get sort of multi-millennial tree ring chronologies. And it's a, it's a remarkable place. And we've been able to get uh, um, understand and make, get, make some really cool scientific inferences as a result of that. Uh, for instance, and this is a paper that we published in um, the Proteins of the National Academy of Sciences a number of years ago that was the first time we were able to build one of these uh, multi-millennial uh, tree ring chronologies. So you can see in the, our monitors are all backwards. Um, this is one of, this is a very heavily uh, sort of a smooth version of the tree ring chronology, but we're able to see that the, uh, going back here, this is, time right now. So that's 0 AD, 1000 AD, the present's moving this way. And this goes back to 1000 BC, 2000 BC. Uh, we're able to use those uh, tree rings to get all the way back that far. And one of the things we're able to show um, with this paper and some work that, that sort of followed up is that the growth we're seeing right now at the upper tree line in the, in the Great Basin in Nevada and California, uh, is exceeds anything we've seen in the past uh, in the past several thousand years, and there's a variety of reasons we think that's related to increased temperature. So we think this is a very good proxy for uh, uh, for temperature going back thousands and thousands of years. The really cool thing about bristlecone pine, though, in these areas is not just that we get the uh, high elevation trees is that there's high elevation trees that are growing way up at the top of the mountain uh, above which it's too cold for any other trees to grow. But then just a, a few hundred meters below that, bristlecone pine uh, can't grow anymore because it becomes too dry and it turns the bristlecone pine ecosystem turns into pinion and juniper uh, an ecosystem after that. Um, and so we have, we have these incredible opportunity here because we have this sort of 5,000 year record at high elevation, at about 3,500, 3,400 uh, meters above sea level, um, where we have this, we have, have this growth pattern that shows this uh, sort of classic hockey stick with increased growth in the 20th century. And then only about uh, 10 kilometers away at the lower forest border, sort of 700 ish meters down slope, uh, 600 meters down slope, we have the location where the Methuselah tree is in the Methuselah chronology. And that record extends back even further. And this is a location where it is too dry for trees uh, to grow below, the, below which, below this elevation is too dry for bristlecone, above this elevation is too cold. And we can correlate these records to instrumental climate variables and then reconstruct temperature at the upper forest border and precipitation at the lower forest border. And it's uh, been a remarkable sort of journey. We're not the first ones to have, have figured this out. Uh, we're building like everybody in science, we're building on the work of others. We've, we've just been able to sort of extend it further. The pioneering work that was done in this field was uh, done by a scientist named Val LaMarche um, who had this absolutely remarkable run of really figuring out exactly how old these trees could grow how old the wood could be that is remaining on the landscape um, and understanding these different forces that would cause trees to grow in different ways, depending on their elevation. So at this site, and this is, this is in the White Mountains in California, uh, Val was able to show that trees at the upper forest border could live for thousands of years and were ultimately limited by how warm it was. And that when it was warmer, the trees were able to grow further up the mountain slope. And then they would leave behind this remnant wood above the tree line as the tree line 
uh, slid back down um, over the last couple of thousand years. And it is now growing uphill. Trees are now growing upslope very, very quickly. And then Val was also able to show that trees at the lower forest border, at the lower elevations of bristlecone pine, were limited by soil moisture avail uh, availability. And uh, Val published these absolutely amazing uh, papers in 1974 um, in the sort of tree ring world. Um, you know, this was uh, akin to sort of Einstein's, you know, Annus Mirabilis, um, you know, in 1905 when Einstein published uh, his four most important groundbreaking works. Uh, Val LaMarche had that in, in 1974 and was able to show this really remarkable thing that above sort of the upper forest border, it's too uh, cold for trees to grow anymore and that their growth and their position on the landscape is limited by what the climate was like, the temperature. And then the lower forest border is where it gets too dry for these trees to grow and both their position on the landscape and their growth patterns uh, can tell you about soil moisture and precipitation variability. And so our work has been to try and reconstruct temperature at the upper forest border and precipitation at the lower forest border. And that's really the work that we've been working on. We've been doing this now for about a, th this particular project for about a decade. The thing we've been sort of stuck with, and this is the only sort of uh, time I'll go into any kind of um, detail on the actual science uh, that we do, is that the upper forest border is, is predominantly limited by temperature variability. So wider rings um, indicate warmer temperatures. But the problem is that even the trees at the far upper forest border uh, get uh, they get hit by drought. So that if it gets too dry, even these trees at the upper forest border um, show, show a precipitation signal. So we've been unable to get like a pure temperature signal. And that's been something I've been working on for, uh, for about a decade now is to try and get a better temperature signal from the upper forest border uh, trees. And so, you know, I've been, I've been working really hard to try and figure out a way if we could unmix uh, this growth signal at the upper forest border and if we did that, we could have sort of two records that were co-located that would give us temperature and precipitation uh, records that would extend back 6,000 years. Um, and that would be a really remarkable thing to be able to, to, be able to do. And uh, like everything in sort of science, you know, you always look back to work that was done before. And uh, Lamarche wrote in, in 1974 that if we could understand the, the apparent altitude of a site, um, so in other words, what the, what the conditions were like in the past, we could really improve our understanding of paleoclimate. And that's been my goal for the last uh, you know, decade plus of working on this. And man, it's been busy. We've you know, published you know, a zillion papers on this subject and it's been a really hard problem to try and uh, unravel. And it's been really exciting. I've been able to so many great students to be able to work with um, over time on this. Um, and we're still going strong on it. We're getting we're getting better results sort of sort of every year. And uh, I'll just highlight some of the grad students that um, that we've we've had working on this, including uh, James Bruning and and Tyler Tran, who both were remarkable uh, Western grad students. That showed that what was real they they figured out that what was really important in these trees was that even at the upper forest border, what we needed to do was pay attention to the the geography and the uh, geophysical sort of setting of individual trees. And that if you paid attention to the climate that individual trees were experiencing, even if they were all growing at the upper forest border, you could get a good understanding of what the climate was like. Um, and then they sort of found that, that down to the scale of sort of tens of meters, the climate can vary enough to affect the individual trees. And so here's uh, here are Tyler and uh, and Jameis, and they spent a summer frogging around the tops of the mountains in the bristlecone pine, attaching these really small temperature sensors uh, to trees to measure the individual trees' response to temperature. And so they went all over this sort of landscape and put these temperature loggers in uh, on on trees growing up at the upper forest border, and they'd put them above the tree line. They'd put them. Um, in hollows, they'd put them on steep slopes, um, they'd put them on different sides of the tree to understand, you know, the temperatures that the trees were experiencing over the course of the day, um, and so on, were able to, after a lot of work, by putting these temperature sensors in these really steep and rough locations, understand that the temperatures, even at the tree line, which we think of as like all sort of one cold, uh, dry place, um, they found that the temperatures can vary 
um, tremendously depending on the topographic setting that you were in. And so they took these temperature models and they were able to paint across the landscape this incredibly complex picture of climate and showed that the individual trees, even though they're all growing up at the very, very upper tree line, even though they're all growing at this place where we think of it as uh, too cold for trees to grow up here, they showed that even on this line along tree line that some trees were experiencing temperatures that were much warmer and some trees that were temperatures that were much colder um, than, their, than their neighbors. And they kicked us off on this work where we were able to do with a bunch of modelers and uh, tree physiologists, a way of unmixing this temperature and precipitation signal. And so I'll show you just a little bit of, of work of work related to, to work that, that they kicked off. Uh, this shows um, 500 years of uh, tree growth at the upper at the upper forest border, and this is the this is the tree ring signal that is mixed. Sometimes it's temperature and sometimes it's precipitation. And they were able to show that if you were to pull out trees that were growing along this very specific threshold of 7.5 degrees, which is a uh, growing season temperature of which um, there's a biochemical uh, signal that, that relates to lignification of the, of the trees, if you're lignification of the cells, if you're able to pull those trees apart and take this one sort of tree ring chronology that's mixed of these trees that are all in the same location, you can throw a rock from one tree to another, but if you pull them apart based on this microclimate um, that's influenced by topography, you can get these incredibly different signals. And so here in these trees that are growing here at, 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 at growing season temperatures of seven degrees Celsius, as opposed to 7.8 degrees Celsius, they show these incredibly different patterns, even though they're growing in the exact same locations on the mountain. Um, and this is a really cool finding that they were sort of kicked off and we were fined over the, over the next few years. Um, it was absolutely uh, a remarkable finding that these trees here were showing a very different growth response from trees right next to them that just had a very slightly different, different growing season temperature. And this is work that we're now sort of working on um, in a lot more sort of depth as we, as we continue to explore what's going on with temperature and precipitation uh, with bristlecone pine. Um, and so what, what you know, our, my grad students and our other research group was sort of able to unravel, and this also includes like sort of undergrads that have helped us out uh, over the years, is that temperature sensitivity in bristlecone pine is limited to these trees that are in the coldest sort of refrigerator pockets uh, even at the upper tree line. And that trees that are at the upper tree line that are not in these tiny little refrigerator pockets um, are much more, tend to be much more limited by drought, which is like kind of like a nerdy thing to figure out, but it really improves our ability to reconstruct temperature uh, going back multiple centuries, which is a really exciting finding. Um, and that's like ultimately what science is about is you work really hard and you try and just figure out something that no one's ever known before. Um, and, uh, that's like really worth celebrating. That's, that's worth being excited about. So what we're working on now, and this is like, I've got, gra I've got graduate students working in the lab right now is that we're working on how do we improve these temperature reconstructions from the upper forest border? And then how do we work on understanding these impacts of volcanic eruptions on tree growth? And then how can we go down to this lower forest border where the oldest trees in the world grow? And how can we reconstruct uh, temperature from uh, from those tree ring chronologies. And we're gonna be going into the field uh, this fall to work down at the lower forest border in order to try and extend uh, this record. And so this tree ring record here is the longest uh, tree ring chronology that we have from bristlecone pine. It goes back, uh, it goes back robustly 8,000 years and can go back even further than that. And Amazingly enough, this tree ring chronology has never really been analyzed. Um, it's it's in, it's an incredible record, but no one's actually really uh, um, explored it in a lot of depth scientifically. It's been sort of a curiosity, and so we're working with this record right now to, uh, to develop what we call a reconstruction quality chronology for doing precipitation reconstruction. And so we're down at the lower forest border, trying to find the oldest pieces of wood in the world to extend this tree ring chronology and make it really robust so that we can continue to, to analyze it. And this is some of the cross sections from dead trees that are not even trees, uh, branches that are remnants on the ground that we're able to 
to take samples of and, and measure the tree rings and then build this incredibly long tree ring chronology from it. Um, and we think by doing this, we're, we're going to be able to extend this tree ring chronology all the way back to 10,000 years um, or 12,000 uh, 12, years, all the way back to what we call the, the, the Younger Dryas. So over this entire recent geologic period of the Holocene, we'll have a full, a full tree ring record. Uh, this is my colleague, Matt Salzer at the University of Arizona. Um, this is a sample right here. And, we're able to, and we sample these things, we just take a tiny little piece off of it. We don't like saw the whole thing. We certainly don't haul the whole piece of wood away. We take a tiny little piece away from it. Uh, this sample here um, dates back to minus 8,000 BC. And that piece of wood's just been sitting on the ground in a very remote location, you know, far from trails, far from where anyone would go. And then what we're doing right now in this field work we're on is trying to find pieces that look like this. And this tree extends back uh, to, um, you know, almost to 12,000 years uh, old. And this is the kind of wood we're looking for to try and build this up and understand what the tree line was like. And this is getting down to the period of deglaciation. And we actually think that the growth patterns in these kinds of remnant pieces on the ground are much more like the upper tree line trees that we see today. And we think there's a chance that the, you know, the tree line was, was hundreds of meters lower than it is today. Um, and we're trying to understand what that, what that was all, what, what that's all about, what those growth patterns are like. So I didn't want to go too deep into the science uh, during this talk. So I'm not, not, uh, not, there's not a lot of weirdos like me that are really into you know, paleoclimatology uh, specifics, but I did kind of want to just give you an overview and a flavor of what the kinds of things we can do with, uh, with tree rings from bristlecone pine and trying also to convey just what incredible organisms they are and what an uh, incredible privilege it is to be able to, um, to study them and get to know, um, you know, just a, just a tiny, tiny bit of their secrets. So I'll, I'm going to stop um, there and I'd like to acknowledge the National Science Foundation, which has uh, funded our, our work for um, going on 15-ish 15, 15 years now. Um, I did mention my graduate students, Jameis and Tyler, who did absolutely amazing work. And uh, there, are, there are others as well, but I talked about Jameis and Tyler's work in here. Um, and we've had a host of just sort of wonderful undergraduates over the years that have worked in the lab and helped us on, on field work. And um, we're hoping to do some more field work um, this coming September that I'm really, really excited for. We missed all last season because of COVID and I'm hoping we're gonna be able to get up into the mountains this, uh, in this fall and, and find some really old wood to look at. So that's it. I thank you all very much for your attention um, and I'd be happy to uh, have any questions. I think Stefan has a whole, a whole plan for, for going <laughs> over questions. Andy, thank you. Well, fantastic. Um, I, I, I love that blending of, um, you know, microclimates, you know, this tree is different from that tree. And then you're trying to use that to span, you know, hundreds or thousands of years. Um, and there was a, a question around that of, you know, if, if microclimate makes such a difference, you know, how, how good is any one tree since you don't know what its microclimate how, how can you think it's representative, I guess, is the question. Uh, yeah, so we have to try and model, um, there's a couple different ways we do that, is we model the microclimate using sort of topography. So we know, like, you know, the, the, the things like cold air drainages, and a lot of you are, you know, mountain people, um, spend time in the mountains and the, the outside. And, you know, there's places like where you'll walk and on a trail, and you sort of notice that it's always cold in that particular location. And that's often because there's a cold air drainage sort of setting up above slope of you and sort of flowing, cold air sort of flows down mountain slopes, um, almost like molasses. It actually sets up in basins and then pours really slowly down mountains and it funnels down through the topography. And over sort of the, this time scale of thousands of years, that topography doesn't change all that much. And so we think we can find these sort of pockets, these refrigerators like pockets um, and model what the temperatures were like over time and then adjust. And so what we have to do is we have to, we have to sort of find the places over time when individual trees are gonna be sensitive to temperature and they sort of wink in and out. Like a, a tree will be sensitive to temperature, um, but then as the climate sort of warms around it, it might then switch over to, a, to being drought uh, response. And so what we have to do is we have to sort of move up and down the mountain slope and select trees and time periods uh, to get the temperature sensitivity. And that's been why this 
work has taken so long and has been so hard is because these trees are, are just so sensitive. They switch from being temperature sensitive to drought strength sensitive over, uh, over, you know, like a half a degree change in, in the, in the overall, on the overall climate. Yeah, kind of mind boggling. Um, <laughs> so the, uh, I'll pair two questions together. One is, um, they're both why questions. Why, why is the tree line so important? And what are the benefits that we get from reconstructing past climates? So, okay, the, um, the why is the why, why tree line is, is, is a good question. And it's this idea in ecology that we call the sort of principle of limiting factors. Um, so if you were to, I'm down in, uh, I'm in Bellingham right now. And, uh, you know, I live in the woods a little bit. And if I were to go out and look at the tree rings in the woods behind me, or like students at Western, if you were to go out in the Sea Home Arboretum and look at the tree rings there, those trees actually don't really give a, uh, a flip about climate. They're really concerned about like the dynamics of the trees growing next to them, whether or not they've got nitrogen, whether there's a tree has fallen nearby and created a light gap. Um, they're much more concerned with like the dynamics of the ecosystem around them. When you get to an extreme environment, uh, competition really declines as a force that governs growth and you're left with the, what we call a top-down signal like climate. And so we need to go to these really extreme environments in order to find places where the ecosystem is being most influenced by climate and less by um, things like ecosystem dynamics. So that's kind of why we work in these extreme environments. Um, and tree line's a great one because it's this ecotone. These like ecologists are fascinated by ecotones, these places where um, where one ecosystem sort of abruptly changes into another ecosystem because there's some there's something happening there. There's some strong force. And so this is a class tree line is like a you know a classic sort of ecotone. Um, and the sort of why to understand past climates is, you know, ultimately understanding the past is going to be the key to understanding the the future. Um, the real reason that the that we we want to understand what's going on in, over the past is that what we'd really like to be able to do is understand how the climate system works sort of mechanistically. And so if we can understand how the climate varied on its own before humans were pumping carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and altering the climate, we can understand how the climate varies all on its own. We can understand sort of the mechanisms by which climate varies. So like, what does a big volcano do to the atmosphere? Um, how do like long live patterns in the ocean, like things like El Nino and the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, how do those variables impact the climate? And so paleoclimatology gives us this window into climate over very long time periods when the climate was uh, unforced. So didn't have people driving it. And by understanding those mechanisms, hopefully we can understand what's gonna happen in the future. Lost my mic. Um, have, have there been studies, um, any similar studies more locally, uh, you know, up at the Baker uh, yep. or Rainier tree lines? Is that? Yeah, so what's really cool about the um, the tree lines around here is that, and it's it's this was sort of surprising to people that don't know the area and people that do know the area won't be surprised. Uh, what governs the tree growth at tree line in the Cascades is mostly related to snowpack. Um, and it's a negative relationship. And so when snowpack is really heavy in a particular year, um, trees like Mountain Hemlock, which is what you'll see up at Mount Baker, uh, at the tree line, that in Silver Fir, um, when the snowpack is really heavy over the year, the trees get a very late start to the growing season. And so don't have time to put on like a wider ring over the course of the year. And so the predominant force the, our tree and chronologists from places like Mount Baker mostly are, can be used to do things like reconstruct uh, um, snowpack. <clears throat> and that's incredibly useful, right? Because we can do things with that, like we can reconstruct um, what stream flow would be like going back thousands of years. And that has really important implications for like water management. Um, so if we know that you can have, you know, natural swings in, in stream flow uh, going back, you know, at Mount Baker, really old trees at Mount Baker, about 500 years old. Um, that environment just doesn't, it's not conducive for, for trees to live uh, much, much longer than that. Um, but we know that like the, the stream flow in the nooksack can vary um, sort of all on its own. We can reconstruct that using, using tree rings. It's cool stuff. Yeah. 
Um, a question about uh, the swamp cowrie in New Zealand. Can oh yeah, cowrie trees. Um, yeah, so those are. Uh, um, I'm not an expert on the cowrie trees by any means, but <clears throat> there are so these really old trearing samples, and there's there's the cowrie trees in New Zealand. Uh, there's really old uh, oaks that are preserved in bogs in um, places like Ireland and Scotland. And what happens is that if, if basically if you can put a piece of wood into an anoxic environment, a place where like basically microbes can't get at it, the wood can be preserved for a really, really long time. And so there are uh, places where um, thousands, even and even tens of thousands of year old wood can be preserved um, by, by being buried in mud or swamps and then be unearthed and then, and then examined. Um, the thing about like those, the New Zealand trees is that they're isolated. So they exist sort of back in time, but there's no bridge to the present. Um, so the bristlecone pine are the, are those trees where we have this thousand year record where it extends all the way to the present and we can date it going all the way back in time, sort of every, every year forever. As long such, as it's know. such an amazing opportunity. Um, we, we're running out, out of time, but a couple of quick, um, maybe quick, uh, how does the bomb effect of nuclear testing affect carbon dating? It's a signal. Um, you can see it in, you can see it in there. That's one of the sort of classic spikes you look for in, um, in, uh, in isotopic signatures that is, is global. Um, so you can affect, and this is, this is a, it's, um, and for a geologist, it's a, it's a, it's a free date um, but for people that, that don't do like tr chronologies like I do, where you're counting individual rings going back. But if you can find the bomb signal in um, um, when you look at carbon isotopes and you can get a, you can get a date using those because we know, we know when the blast occurred. Yeah. It doesn't affect their growth. It's, it's, uh, but the, you can tell, you can, you can look at it in the isotopic record. Um, and then, so of, of all the trees you've, you've studied, uh, yeah. do you have a, a favorite, either species or individual tree uh, that, that you've worked with? Um, yeah, I mean, it's the bri bristlecone are my my favorite trees for sure. Um, I uh, I I love them. I've been you know studying for years, um, and they're just so magnificent. I, I like it is one of those places that you should go, you know, during your life. Stefan, have you been to the ancient bristlecone pine forest? Oh, it's on my on the list. It's on the list. I mean, you've been almost everywhere, man. I'm shocked you haven't been there. Um, it's they are absolutely remarkable. I mean, to be in their presence, in the presence of these five thousand year old trees, and they're just so they're so ghostly and other looking. Um, it's really uh, it's transformative. It's like a really incredible thing to do. Yeah, yeah, great F the photography there alone of, of the, your talk is yeah, it's wonderful. cool stuff. Andy, thank you. Um, fascinating, good stuff. Keep it up. Um, look forward to more. Um, next week, um, quick plug for next week, we've got Liz uh, Schottman and Lee First, who will be talking about seabed mining and recent legislation there to prevent the same. Uh, as always, all the details are on the website. Um, same same time, 4.30 every Thursday this, this quarter. Uh, again, Andy, thank you. Great. Uh, look forward to more. Cool. Um, thank you all. And uh, Stefan, great job. And I'm looking forward to seeing the rest of the rest of the speakers. Okay. It's going to be a good quarter. All right.